This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline. Kyle Lee Warrenshaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. And if you were down with us for our conference previews, you obviously can see we are punching the clock. We're burning that midnight oil. It's our coveted autopsy reports. And man, we got a quadruple body <laughs> body bag going on, man. Oh my God, lay them all out in the slab, man. It's 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 that time of the year, bro. Um, when we have to basically, man, we got to put in that over that work, bro. We got to put in that work. My man, Mr. Warren Shaw, ripping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I mean, we can't even do long intros, man. We got to we got to body up fourteen. We got to go. We got to skate. <laughs> it was Grim Reaper week in the NBA playoffs. <laughs> the Reaper was on overtime himself. Was like uh, tapping everybody on the shoulder. Need you to log out. Need you to log out. <laughs> I need some Undertaker music. <laughs> you Kane or am I Undertaker? Am I Undertaker? You Kane? I don't know. Like, no. <laughs> like I'll go Kane. I'll go Kane. You go Kane because you want the red fire coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, for those of y'all who've been down with us throughout the course of the last month or so, man, our coveted autopsy reports where we'll be talking about the teams who have been ousted. What's their future going to be like? What's been going on? And it's been awesome. We've been getting great feedback on it. And obviously, you know, a lot of the teams that we'll be talking about today are the teams that have just been recently exited out of the NBA playoff picture. So this week's autopsy reports will be covering the, the Suns, the Knicks, Warriors, and the Sixers, specifically in that order. As always, we appreciate you and yours for hopping on board with us this week. Be sure to get my man Shaw at Shaw Sports NBA or get at me at Game Face Lee. The show's Twitter handle at NBA Baseline, available on all the major platforms. You know where to find us. Um, also go to www19 mediagroupcom to check out our show and a litany of other shows that are out there. If you want to catch this and all the previous episodes and all tops of reports that we've been doing, including the conference previews, be sure to go to www.thebaselinenba.com. So Shaw, let's not waste any time with it. Autopsy report first on the slab, Phoenix Suns. This team got exposed and that's probably putting it nicely by the Denver Nuggets. And while I don't think anything needs to be made about only them losing the way that they did to the Phoenix Suns, I think we obviously saw a team so desperate to to try and replicate what they gave us uh, a few seasons ago um, that it's hard to imagine what what this team is going to look like now with everything that's been committed uh, with the roster as is currently constructed. The roster. Let's, let's use that word very, very lightly. <laughs> well, do you want to use roster or rasta? Right? Like you know what I'm saying, because like you may have to actually <laughs> you you may actually need to be on something <laughs> in, yeah. in order to, to, to come down from the from the high. <laughs> the Suns, the Suns have six players next year. Two of them with non-guarantees. And campaign and, and Chris Paul are, are two of those guys. Uh so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You you stripped the roster uh, to to acquire Kevin Durant, age thirty four, coming up with multiple injuries, but still Hall of Fame talent, Paramount alongside Booker. And there were times, there were flashes in the playoffs where it looked like, damn, those guys might be able to get it done. Um, but I'm gonna fast forward here, obviously, to Game Six against the Denver Nuggets. No Chris Paul, no DeAndre Ayton. They get lambasted. To me, I'm looking at it and I'm framing it differently from the embarrassment that was last year against the Dallas Mavericks. That was a complete failure and letdown. But this one, not to say is excusable, but they were down to yet another starter. And it played every game in the series except for that one. And Chris Paul obviously had missed, you know, from, from game two until that one as well. To, to run with that cast of having campaign be out there and Tory Craig and, and Damian Lee and TJ Warren and Okogi and guys like that, that that's just not where you want to be as a, as a roster. So Monty Williams becomes the latest victim of cancel coach culture in the NBA. And I understand the black and white of what happened, but to me, the parameters of this year are different from last year completely. But if you want to roll it all in a, in a ball and say, cool, He's the guy. Now he's a scapegoat. Fine. If you listen to a Woj report, Ishbi has come in and has kind of graded and fought against uh, Monty Williams from the time he's been there since, I guess, February. 
And now James Jones's role has been reduced some. Ishbia is basically running the team and not James Jones as 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 the general manager. I don't know how it's going to go. And we saw how that went for Cuban, I think, at times when he was in Dallas and he was trying to really uh, have his hand in all of the decisions. That that usually goes goes a little bit left. Yes, you got Kevin Durant, but again, you you gutted the roster. And I'm sure he's willing to pay what, whatever he wants, but they don't have the ability to just say, yeah, let's just run this back and see what happens and, and what we do in terms of continuity next year. And now you got to bring a new coach into this as well. Um, for me, Phoenix is... Uh, is, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad story because this is a team that was in the NBA Finals a couple of seasons ago, had a 2-0 lead. Maybe they're taking that into account as well, too, um, and saying that maybe he can't get it done, get it done in big moments. But, you know, it, it sucks to see Monty Williams go because, you know, we like him on the baseline. Uh, but ultimately, the Suns, the Suns team is flawed, but it's not all his fault. Yeah, so the Suns team is flawed. It's not all his fault. But he does he is very culpable for, how do I put this, the lack of – versatility that I, I, he was he was incapable of of exhibiting it in its most critical times okay now i gotta parse that out because the players go out and they play this game but that's not what the excuse should be right in justification in the justification of, of firing monty williams you just don't fire a head coach who has arguably gotten this phoenix suns team to how many times in the playoffs now? Four years consecutively, right? Three years, four years, thought, three years in a row. <laughs> three years in a row. Was it? Was it? Was he? Because the bubble, the bubble season, they didn't make the playoffs, and then they came out and was right. like the first seed. That's they right. went to the three finals years and they, in yeah. a bubble season. It felt like they were playoff. They were playoff worthy, right? Yeah, because remember they finished the bubble eight and zero, and everyone was like, "Oh, they're the right. the bubble darlings." They were playoff and worthy. And, and 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 we want to give Monty Williams his flowers for that because you looked at that roster and you were saying to yourself, the hell, like, is nobody going to take notice that this team is actually a, a good basketball team? And you fast forward now to, 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 to what took place here. Uh, to me, I'm going to put more of the onus on James Jones on this, okay? And, and I'm not saying this because I don't like James Jones. I've loved a lot of the moves that James Jones has made. And I obviously understood, I think he read the writing on the wall, like this was probably his last all-in move that he could possibly make to even give any indication that he wanted to see this Phoenix Suns team go all the way. But my problem has always been in, 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 the, in the type of roster that you have, if you lean in too heavily, do you have enough on the back end to be able to help execute which you're probably not going to be able to get from even your best players through the course of that of the rest of that season, right? If this was a move that was made at the beginning of the season, Shaw, how likely would we have seen would we be talking about the Phoenix Suns at the the way that we were talking about them going through what they were remember, they were they were a below 500 team before they had basically made that that move. They weren't exactly like, you know, head and shoulders one of the better teams or anything like that. Everybody knew something probably had to be done to this roster because it just wasn't it just wasn't working out which is part of the reason why you know you could have questions about whether or not Monty Williams lost the voice in that locker room in some degree in some respects you know what i'm saying sure. but even adding Kevin Durant to the mix i just felt like as much as i wanted to buy into the the level of dominance that could potentially be for this team i didn't think it was good enough dealing with the type of teams that they were going to be surrounded by even if they did get into the playoffs I just think it's too daunting of a task, and I just don't have that confidence that I had like two years ago when they did make it to the finals and had to play against the Milwaukee Bucks about whether or not they've got it in them to run it through the way people potentially keep trying to say that they saw within these guys just with the small sample size of games that they played. I, I just wasn't completely buying it. And it's just interesting to me because, again, if guys don't come in with the same mentality, with the same quote unquote level of desperation about what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve and accomplish, it could go, it could go sideways real quick. And we're not going to say that. We're not going to talk about that. But that's exactly, in my opinion, what happened here. As great as Kevin Durant is, what that team needed, what that team ultimately required, they 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 never had it because either Chris Paul was injured or he wasn't playing at that level that he gave you three years ago. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So like a lot of this, it to me comes down to, well, 
where you get that? You're going to get that from Damian Lee. You were going to get that from uh, 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 from Josh Kogi. You know what I'm saying? Or Tory Craig or whoever else was on the roster at that time. None of that was happening. And it all bore fruit when you saw Devin Booker and Kevin Durant get stymied by a good, deep basketball team like the Denver Nuggets and a lot of other teams that the Phoenix Suns would have had to go through if you ever thought that they were going to get to an NBA Finals. So because they have multiple teams to get to, I, I'm not going to go into the the full maybe assessment here. But I think something has to happen with DeAndre Ayton. I think they need to move Ayton and uh, split should, him up in that, that sense. That was, that, and that, to, again, to me is a mistake. Resigning eight, I, I, I just, I, to me, I get it. I get it. I, but they, now that they have him, I think they need to basically try to trade him for multiple guys because you have to fill out the roster. Exactly. All the guys that are going to be actual free agents: Tory Craig, Darius Beasley, Bismack Biyombo, Damian Lee, Josh Kogi, TJ Warren, Jock Londale. How yeah. many of those guys? It's Wayne Wright. How many of those guys do you want to actually bring back and pay significant luxury tax money for? Maybe two of those guys. I think Londell is probably Landell has earned his right to be on this roster. So you bring him back to some degree. Maybe Damian Lee, maybe a Kogi, maybe even TJ Warren, but he probably wants to go get a bag somewhere. Um, to me, Aiton is the obvious move. You try is try like hell to move him and see if you can get, you know, a, a big that can help you, and then maybe two or three other parts because you don't really have draft equity now as, as a result of the Kevin Durant trade. They will try to kick the tires on a Chris Chris Paul trade. Don't think there'll be any takers there at $60 million at 30 years old over the next two years. Again, not guaranteed money. So they could try to buy them out, but then where does that leave you? Leave you without with, yeah. with nothing there and one less roster, one less roster guy on your on your team. So to me, it's 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 Booker. Sorry, it's Aiden that you try to move. Hope KD stays healthy and you fill out the rest of this roster otherwise, and you're already at $165 million right now. Well, I with six me, guys. Well, here, well, here's my thing. Um, whoever you're going to bring in as the head coach is going to is going to have to really evaluate on what tempo or style of offense does this team play at its most effective and and, and its optimal level. I, I really think whoever in the next coaches should be needs to be unafraid and unabashed about the idea of possibly having Chris Paul come off the bench. I I I, I and I know that sounds foolish. You and love crazy. guys on the bench, though. I will say that. You no, know what, what, what I'm saying is is that they need somebody to elevate their ability to move up and down the court more effectively, right? Um, to allow Booker and Durant. I, I, there is To me, there's more flow. Now, whether you want to, hey, maybe you insert Cameron Payne if you believe that that's the dude. That's Fine. The answer. But, no, but that's what I'm saying. They have to make a decision or a choice about what, what version. Or if, if it's going to be, you know what? Move Devin to the point. But at some point, the idea, I'm not, what I'm trying to say is, you can't have Chris Paul, Devin Booker, and Kevin Durant on the court at the same time and expect to win. Chris Paul can't stay on the court long enough. And obviously, Chris Paul and the way that he plays, I think, is counterintuitive to the way that Booker and Durant are are and their ability to get open and get shots and 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 open up space for the floor. I think it makes Chris Paul an anomaly. So I, to me, but again, it's going to come down to the head coach that they hire now since they've now gotten rid of Monty Williams, because I think Monty Williams may have probably taken the off season to figure out a way to implement that with Chris Paul. But to me, it'll always be Chris Paul not being healthy or Chris Paul really not being in the requisite shape for the way that Booker and Durant need to play for the Suns to have the kind of offensive scoring efficiency for necessary for us to believe in their dominance. No, and that, and again, I think your point is, is very valid about the coaching situation. So again, if I go back to Monty, Durant was healthy for what eight, nine games in the regular season after they acquired him. That's not enough time. Uh, yeah, he's plug and play like anybody else, but it's not enough time, especially when Chris Paul goes down and then DeAndre eight misses your last game as well. I'm sure Monty wanted at least one crack at this, one full crack at it with whatever roster to just to try to get the continuity at the top of the roster in place. And that just didn't happen. So ultimately, Phoenix bows out here with lots of questions when it goes, it comes to the offseason. Not a whole lot of draft equity, if any at all. And already $165 million in committed salary with just six guys on, on contract. Outlook is looking like what for them next season, Shaw? Well, I mean, it just depends now. Again, it's funny you mentioned James Jones because if if you believe the Woes report, if Jones feels like he's being undermined in some capacity, well, does he just walk off the job? So are they looking at now a general manager or president of basketball operations, whatever you want to call it, and the coach? You know, we have the draft lottery coming up. We have the draft coming up here in a month and in that of itself too. A lot needs to be figured out. 
you know? So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's kind of very much in flux. And anytime we do an autopsy report and now one of the main pieces in terms of like the coach is gone, it, it's hard now to figure out what the team is going to look like in the following season, because you don't know what the, what the strategy of that coach is. So we, we are kind of like headless here or a boat without a rudder, as they say, don't know what direction they're heading in. Um, but they need bodies, <laughs> what types of bodies that's going to be dependent on who they hire as a head coach. All right, man. You're tuned to the baseline. Cali Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA are coveted autopsy reports. We body up those teams and get right into the heart of it. Examine and exhume. All right. Coming up, we're going to be talking about the New York Knicks. And with the New York Knicks, what is their future going to look like, especially after getting ousted in the semifinals by the Miami Heat? You don't want to miss out on that. Looking for the ultimate destination for NBA gear? Well, then look no further than the NBA store with a huge selection of authentic and high quality products, including jerseys, hats and accessories. The NBA store has everything you need to show off your team pride. Plus, with exclusive and limited edition items, you can make your collection truly one of a kind. And with an online presence, you can shop from anywhere in the world. Don't miss out on the latest trends and experiences. Visit the NBA store today by clicking our affiliate link. If you're listening to us on your favorite audio platform, be sure to check the link in the description of the show. That's nbastore.vwz6.net slash baseline. The baseline is working in affiliation with the NBA store slash fanatics and will be compensated for your patronage by utilizing our link. That's nbastore.vwz6.net slash baseline. And as always, we thank you for your support. New York Knicks next on the slab here on the baseline. Yes, sir. Kyle Warnshaw, Baseline NBA podcast and our coveted autopsy report. Next on the slab, Shaw, the New York Knicks. Fifth best team in the Eastern Conference, made it to the Eastern Conference semifinals, um, got knocked out by the Miami Heat. But, you know, if you are a New York Knicks fan, and I, and I often say this because I often feel like New York Knicks fans tend to be very, very like nowish, we everything needs to happen nowish, very spoiled in some regards. I take this season as an even more positive season than the season that they showed us two years ago, right? Where it looked like to what many people believed is that they overachieved because the following season, they obviously struggled mightily. It's amazing to me that even after the effort that you got, while all of the praises about Jalen, oh God, Jalen Brunson, that's he's the dude, and you know, like, oh, that was the smartest move made, and you know, what I'm saying that, you know, f forget, you know, uh, Donovan Mitchell and all of that stuff. We need to trade Jul Julius Randle, and I'm just sitting here saying, my God, can 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 you at least acknowledge that you had a good basketball team that competed? and it arguably was two games away from maybe even going to the Eastern Conference Finals when you really had no business even being even in that level of the conversation, and it wasn't because they lucked themselves in doing it. They earned it, man. The Knicks earned this opportunity for us to talk about them in a good way, Shaw, because they've got some good players who can actually get better, not worse. They can actually get better, and shouldn't that be the focus of conversation for a team that had 47 wins got to the Eastern Conference semis, and arguably gave the Miami Heat a run for their money. Knicks don't like to have nice things, man. Oh, man. <laughs> Damn it. They don't. <laughs> Listen, I, I will say I was a little surprised that they handled Cleveland in the way that they did. I thought that was going to be a longer series, and I thought it was a pick em, to to be honest with you. Not surprised that they beat Cleveland, but they, they handled Cleveland. Um, and, and to dispatch them in five games. And I'm sure they felt like they were the better team. And as many teams have probably felt so far against the Miami Heat, they're more talented top to bottom, but they didn't have the requisite, you know, umph, if you will. And while there's some question about whether how healthy Randall actually was, you know, he, he came back and he was on the floor. And then once you're on the floor, you know, listen, all bets are off. Nobody wants to hear that you're, you're banged up or you're bruised, like you're out here. And then if you can't play, then don't play at all. Um, and now you're seeing, you know, burning jerseys and, tearing down his posters and now we're back on that again um after what was an all nba type season from the guy you know it's just it's tough and, and i know I'm brunson is a lead I'm guy curious, I guess I'm like, you know what man deuces i mean like enough with you people like straight up and down you know what yeah. Jul julius randall is 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 an offensive version of charles oakley and i don't see them burning charles oakley jerseys you know what i'm saying but do you think charles oakley was going to go out there and give you 25 freaking points a game you know what i'm saying that, I mean, it's amazing to me. 
I'm not saying that I'm fawning over Julius. I like Julius Randle. I really do. I genuinely liked him, as always liked him when he came out of Kentucky. And I don't think he's ever really gotten a fair dig. You at, at times, Shaw, have even said, you know, I've, <laughs> that guy Randall, that boy chucks up shots. He, he's a ball hog. And rightly so. You know what I'm saying? But he, he gave the New York Knicks an opportunity, a window, for them to make the kind of moves that they've made to put him in this position. And we're not even giving him that kind of credit. It's just yeah. like, it's well, amazing. He's not the reason, he's not the, the reason they lost the series. And yeah, uh, exactly. Fibs also was a little bit stubborn. Uh, obviously, he had to run guys into the ground, and that's neither here or there. Uh, but, the, but the team, especially in this playoff run, versus Miami specifically, lacked shooting. And then there's some people who was like, well, at, at, at some point, you at least have to dust off Evan Fournier, who you're paying you know, $18, $19 million a year, to at least give it a chance. I, I'm not saying he's the answer, but they're, they're, it's, it's a, a possible counter. answer. Not a counter, exactly. <laughs> It's there was, a possible there was more moves that Eric Spolstra made that even if they did or they didn't work out, there were still moves being made. It yeah. still changed the look or the dynamic of the way that the New York Knicks had to, to, to play, whether it be offensive or defensive. And I think that's what it boils down to. Fibs is so defensive minded that he didn't want to take the risk of Fournier getting exposed defensively in any capacity to even give him a chance to come out there and shoot some three balls. I um, mean, uh, you alluded to it, I think, you know, earlier on another show um, with quickly, quickly being out the last two games that just limited their offensive options. So, so, so much. Um, and while again, he's not the end all be all savior as well too. And you just needed more options offensively. So that's what makes it more, a little bit of an indictment for me that Fibs didn't try to at least search down the little the bench a little bit further and say, all right, Fournier, let me give you four minutes, see what you can do for me. If you can knock down a couple of shots and if you fail, you fail. Uh, but now that's just kind of a, a bullet you've never shot. It's just kind of stayed in the chamber. And ultimately you get dispatched in six games and, you know, Hey, shout to Jalen Brunson. He, he nearly brought them back. The Knicks had a chance to win that game six. And again, you never know what happens in the game seven, especially on your home floor, but we didn't get to that. We didn't get to that, but I, I want to actually really talk about someone who, I really think the mo I don't want to say the ire should be be focused on him more, but I really feel like if now if there's ever a question of what moves can possibly be made by Leon Rose in, in improving this basketball team, I think now is the opportunity for you to really evaluate and say, where does RJ Barrett fit on this roster? Where does he fit on this team? Let me tell you what I mean by this, Shaw. The moment that Emmanuel quickly went down is the moment that RJ Barrett needed to step up and utilize his point guard skills to help offset or take the burden off of Jalen Brunson, who is constantly getting throttled by traps and double teams, you know what I'm saying, by the Miami Heat. And that, to the credit of Eric Spolstra, recognizing that they didn't have another primary ball handler that, 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 that the Knicks could rely on. To me, they were so focused, like, Knicks fans are so focused on Barrett shooting the basketball. Damn it, Barrett's ability to dribble, penetrate, and allow Jalen Brunson to move around and, and get open. They could have had a two-man game going, but you can't do that because R.J. Barrett is limited in his abilities to play the game of basketball. It doesn't have to be in playoff basketball. This is what you saw through the course of the season. And while he scored almost 20 points per game, a lot of that is Fugazi, man. A lot of that is more because of Jalen Brunson and his ability to give R.J. Barrett the opportunities. But what we have seen time and time again is where we thought that there was versatility that was there having a guy like R.J. Barrett on this roster, I think has become a liability. And now you have to wonder with the dynamic that Jalen Brunson does give you, and you have Josh Hart, and you've got Emmanuel quickly, what role does R.J. Barrett truly play for this Knicks basketball team if they're going to take the next step? Because I think there is opportunity there where you can either put somebody in that can give you what clearly R.J. Barrett is lacking, or you really have to seriously hone in on him taking this offseason to be able to do the, the requisite things to make him a better basketball player that the Knicks are going to need if he's going to still be on this roster. I'm just going to parse it out by saying R.J. Barrett is 22 years old. So I think yes, there's, I understand. There's, there's, there's still plenty of time for that to happen. Then his extension kicks in next year. And while, while he may not be the hero they wanted, uh, and it, even the hero they needed, I think, in this series, there's still room for him to become that guy down the line. Um, I don't think the Knicks are going to give up on him just yet. But you're right. He has homework to do. 
Um, and I, I'm not really picking on his play as much because he, he gave him 20, shot 37, you know, 0.8% from the three point line, even, even the series. So I think he was fine, but he wasn't able to elevate. And I think that's what you're looking for, looking for that guy to be able to elevate the team, especially when, when Randall clearly wasn't right. Let me ask this question. And Brunson was just getting double and triple team. Did you want to see Josh Hart to be a primary ball handler for the New York, for the New York Knicks? I mean, right. we, we, we know that what that leads to. That's a right, no. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and, and so to me, your your best ball handler was R.J. Barrett when you didn't have Jalen Brunson. That suddenly went mm, away. I, I, I do disagree with that. I don't think R.J. is as good off the bounce as you may, may think he is. I'm just um, saying of the rest of the roster that was available to you, right? Like like Julius Randle was not 100%. Sure. Right? All right. Who else, who else are you going to? Who else is on that roster that you're going to say that I want I want to get the ball? There's nobody else to handle. That's saying right. so that, but that's – I, I don't know that because there's nobody else to handle. You just now you say, okay, well, Barrett, do that. It's different from what we we're saying before in terms of like you're like you're lacking shooting, so you're bringing Fournier to do what he does. Like he's supposed to be a shooter. RJ Barrett is not supposed to be a playmaker, so to try to make him one in the playoff situation, I think is is tough. Now there are some out there, and and you didn't go this route, so you know I'm, I'm maybe a little surprised, but there are some that are out there. I was like, well, if you didn't dust off Evan Fournier, why didn't you at least dust off Derrick Rose? And Derek Rose is doing interviews with Shams and saying, hey, I still got more to give, so forth and so forth. He has a team option next year. I I, I can't even, I mean, maybe he wants the, maybe he wants the dollars, but why would he come tip. back? So then we do put this on tips, right? Like, yeah. why could you have not been confident enough to at least give run Derek Rose? You have Rose to out try. You, like have you to just try. you have to try. Right. And, and and I think, you know, I said maybe we're being a little hard because they almost pulled out game six. They really did. Brunson had that late turnover, you know, trying to hit Julius Randle in the lane when he had Josh Hart clearly open on the wings, but he didn't trust. He didn't trust his former Villanova, you know, teammate to make to make that play. Fair, he tried to squeeze it into Randle. Fair. But that's hard to like to 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 fuss at Brunson, who played a masterful game in that and otherwise. Right, right. But but in all fairness, he didn't get help from 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 his guys, right? The same guys that are camping out there did not come out leak out to give an outlet to Brunson once he tried to, you know, to squeeze through the trap. He knew he was going to have to go into that. They knew he was going to wind up running into that trap. He knew he was going to wind up in that trap. It was going to be one of two things. Whoever was cutting to the basket had to get there early enough. Julius Randle obviously wasn't, right? And so if that was the case, Brunson should have had the outlet to be able to kick back out to the opposite side, you know, move it back over to the, uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the weak side. He couldn't do that. Because there was nobody there. Now, that's I'm tough, not, though, I'm not, if I'm I remember, not, if I remember the play anyone, correctly, though, saying, but the lane was clogged, so he wouldn't have had a lane to kick to the weak side. He had to keep his strong side, and that's where Hart was. So no. he wouldn't need to pass backwards as opposed to trying to pass, you know, you know, where he could actually see you facing because the lane was clogged. There's only like three, four guys he didn't win that lane. But again, like I said, we're nitpicking the one play, and Brunson was masterful. Otherwise, at the end of the day, there needed to be more options available to the Knicks. To, to try to pull out that series. So as we as we forge ahead, you know, again, Toppin, uh, Emmanuel quickly, Quentin Grimes, all those guys are back and you know, on deals that you know the, the Knicks are have to figure out to next year whether they're going to extend. But this team is probably going to come back almost in its full capacity. You, you can figure they're probably going to try to trade Evan Fournier. Maybe they don't pick up the team option on, on Derrick Rose, but the rest of it seems pretty pretty assured like that that's going to come back hartenstein i think was a godsend for them in a lot of ways played big big minutes for them when he was there mitchell right. robinson was able to be healthy most of the year for the most part um i don't know that there's a lot of wiggle room to to roster uh differentiation differentiation here you know because i think a lot of these guys are under contract and you know a lot of people are calling for tibbs's job and i don't know if that's going to happen but I, it doesn't seem to be like there's going to make any big swings here you know for from leon rose and the guys so so two things um I don't think Tibbs is going anywhere. I think the fact that he was able to get this team to the semifinals and the way that he was able to get this team to dominate the Cleveland Cavaliers, albeit whether we think that, you know, that's more on the Cavaliers or or that actually is, you know, the 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 um Tibbs influence on this team to step their game up and and play the level that they've played. I, I think that Tibbs is gonna still get another season. I think the key here, Shaw, is to your point, what Tibbs does with this roster come next year and whether or not it leads to or equates to more wins than what they gave us, right? Like we're trying to see if this team is going to be another 40 or 45 plus up win Tim basketball team, or they should be a 49 plus up basketball team, right? Because none of the other teams in their division are going anywhere, right? 
And maybe if at best we're saying they're going to be better than the Toronto Raptors, but we're probably not going to say that they're going to be better than the Boston Celtics, than the, than the Philadelphia 76ers, right? They, they, they should be better than the Brooklyn Nets. But we did give an autopsy report saying, hey, what version of the Brooklyn Nets, you know, that comes out, you could look at some of the talent on that team and they can all take a step up and they've got young pieces as well. So to your point, I think the execution is going to be on what supplemental part, what role players can allow us to give Tom Thibodeau versatility. I think Tom Thibodeau has dictated mostly for the years that he's coaching what kind of roster he wants. And I think Leon Rose has to actually take it upon himself to say, I need the type of roster that allows us to be versatile and to be able to throw multiple looks against whoever we're playing against. And if it means that Tibbs can't be on board with that, then I think that question is going to be answered by the time that we see what version of the New York Knicks are going to be for this Nick, for this upcoming season and moving beyond. Because you can't tell me having the level of play that you're getting from Jalen Brunson and obviously for what you probably get from Jaylis, Julius Randle if he replicates that and whatever versions you get of R.J. Barrett, of, of Obi Toppin, of Mitchell Robinson and these guys. It all has to be elevated levels. And if Tibbs can't do that, then I think you re recognize that Tibbs Tim's run as the head coach for the Knicks has run his course. I'm just going to say Tim's and versatility probably not happen. Well, but, but to do that, you have to put the requisite pieces to make it glaringly. Like we saw part of that, right? Remember when they made the play to bring in uh, Cam Reddish <laughs> and, and, and look, I don't know if Cam Reddish is or isn't a, a, a bad player. I just noted if the Knicks did not look like a successful basketball team, that would have been an indictment on Tibbs because everybody kept saying that Cam Reddish should have been getting run on that roster. No. So, there you go. <laughs> You're tuned to the baseline. Callie Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA, our coveted autopsy reports. Discussing the teams that are on the slab. Now up next, man, we got to focus our attention on the Golden State Warriors. Defending champs, no longer in the playoff picture. What does that mean for this team moving forward? We'll be talking about that. But first, are you looking for the ultimate destination for NBA gear? Well, then look no further than the NBA store. With a huge selection of authentic and high-quality products, including jerseys, hats, and accessories, the NBA store has everything you need to show off your team pride. Plus, with exclusive and limited edition items, you can make your collection truly one of a kind. And an online presence, you can shop from anywhere. Don't miss out on the latest trends and experiences. Visit the NBA store today by clicking our affiliate link. If you're listening to us on your favorite audio platform, be sure to check that link in the description of the show. The baseline is working in affiliation with the NBA store uh, slash fanatics and will be compensated for your patronage by utilizing our link NBA store VWZ six dot net slash baseline. That's NBA store VWZ six dot net slash baseline. And as always, we thank you for your support. Warriors Shaw Lee autopsy coming up next on the baseline. We are back. Cali Warren Shaw, Baseline NBA Podcast, our coveted autopsy reports. Shaw and I burning that midnight oil. Um, all right, Shaw. Next up, we're bodying up the defending NBA champion, Golden State Warriors. Ansa Ramosley got exited by the Los Angeles Lakers. I, I'm sure that LeBron James is feeling mighty happy <laughs> of disp dispatching any of that conversation about Steph Curry possibly being greater than LeBron James and, you know, all this other type of nonsense. But I think a bigger question really has to be had about the Golden State Warriors. And it's not about this nonsense of, you know, is the dynasty over? I really think that a conversation has to be made about can the Golden State Warriors thrive with the type of roster that they are continually constructing moving forward? Because as you can see, they've been able to get away with the idea of playing with a relatively small ball type lineup. But I've also seen that the type of ball players that they have are still, let's just say, not as quote unquote savvy and intuitive on playing up to the level that's required when the situation typically calls for it. Now, they've been able to get away with it with some of the teams that they've played against. But I think in this instance, when you have to play against a team that's going to be more physical than you, that's going to be um, longer than you, probably maybe even more athletic than you. We've not seen certain players be able to step up. Don't know if that's age. Don't know if that's attrition. Don't know what that is, Shaw. 
but it does something. It, it, it does say something about the Golden State Warriors and the makeup of the rosters. If we're talking about to what Steve Kerr said, you know, given everything that's happened and what what took place, this just wasn't a championship team. Those comments throw me mm. <laughs> like they, they, they just do because it's. I don't know. I mean, I know you can't come out and say that as you're going into the playoff series against the Lakers and say, well, we're not a championship team. We're going to lose. But if that's like what you like, I, I don't know, man, it's just it's just a weird thing to hear them say kind of after the fact that I, I, I don't really know how it sits with me. But I, to your earlier point, I think even saying he's like the dynasty is over. Um, listen, Clay and, and Dre, technically, I think everyone's trying to get Dre out of here already. Um, they all have one more year. Uh, Bob Myers is the one who's who's up. In the, in the front office and obviously he's key to what they do in terms of the roster construction but as you were talking about the youth on this team um don't really get the chance to develop because the veterans are hall of fame veterans trying to win nba championships and, 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 and it's hard to operate in both timelines when you're really trying to run a franchise let me inject this to your point so you can continue further shaw ramona shelburne brought up that point in regards to you had to look back to the incident that occurred between jordan pool and Draymond Green. And if you'd be foolhardy not to think that that didn't become a, a tone setter on the perception about where where the loyalty and, and the makeup of this team truly lies, you see the differences in what she says, the, the core championship group and the younger guys. And I think it reared its ugly head in what we saw on how this team performed against the Los Angeles Lakers, who looked more cohesive than yeah. this version of the Golden State Warriors. I'm going to do a cheesy thing, you know, you know, forgive me, walk with me for a little bit, but I don't know if you remember the movie Stomp the Yard. And you know, they kind of had like the young, hot guys coming in there. Uh, Columbus Short was the hot shot freshman coming in and trying to teach the old school guys, hey, you got to institute this, whatever, whatever, whatever. I don't know that they have a, a Columbus Short on their <laughs> on their roster, so to speak, but they are leaning I'd very, say, very heavy. Jordan Poole is Columbus Short. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jordan, well, Jordan Poole think he got swag though, you know. He's oh, okay. Spending, spending half a yeah, half a million short on, shorts. on ice spice or whatever. So yeah, short shorts and compression in the in the compression tights. <laughs> okay. But to me, that it's it's a hard it's a hard um narrative to kind of to run and set it's a timelines when you're trying to do two things at once. And you have to pay homage and respect to what are Hall of Fame players who've who've got you four NBA championships versus some of the young talent but that that young talent i don't think is generational in any capacity so that's why they're reluctant to even try to develop them but you need them to at least be contributing role players um i think the warriors are what we'll see with the warriors is really dependent on what happens with bob myers and and if he goes and leaves and uh that might really shake the shake the organization in a way that some people may not truly be cognizant of uh wiggins is i think fine he signed for another you know three four years so he's good there Obviously, he's found his role. Steph is 35. He'll be making $51 million next year, but he's Steph Curry. So, so you, you you paid and, and you don't even match your eye. He still gives you almost 30 points per game. Yeah. I think, he, I I think, think, I think the question is Clay. I not want to be. Yeah. I, well, it's I'm, Clay. I'm, and, um, you know, I know he worked himself back. You know, everybody loves him. He's a little bit goofy and, you know, cheesy and corny himself at times or whatever. But he's when he's right, he's a sniper. He's one of the best to ever do it from the outside. Um, but he did not look right in this playoff series against the Lakers. And it's Absolutely. it's tough. It's tough to I, I'm not I'm trying not to just talk about the money, but it's tough to pay somebody forty three million dollars who is not contributing at a high level. It you it can't just be like, all right, well, thank you for your service money, especially if you're still trying to win NBA championships. And clearly that's what the Warriors think they should still be in that window. This is the reason why we we were having this conversation off, you know, off the air, Shaw, about I think a lot I think uh, I think a lot of this maybe to your point is going to be about Bob Myers. I think a lot of this is going to come down to Steve Kerr and 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 the coaching staff and them taking this off season and really focusing and honing in on how do we maximize the offensive effectiveness that the Golden State Warriors should exhibit on a night in night out basis. Should the primary focal point be Steph and Clay, the Splash Brothers? Or should we start talking about Clay taking maybe a step back? Maybe him not. You, hold on. Are you bringing Clay off the bench? No, I'm not bringing Clay. <laughs> no. Why do you always have me saying that I'm saying oh, these guys got to come on? 
<laughs> you like to bring guys off the bench. I thought that's where you were going. No, no. I'm, don't don't put me in a grave, damn it. You know what I'm saying? Still got other bodies to talk about. Um, no, but I, I do think that you, you have to look at the way that the ball moves and the execution of the offense and who should wind up with the basketball on certain looks and certain opportunities and certain times. And oftentimes the Warriors make it a priority to try to, in, you know, to, to bring in Clay, to get Clay his opportunities, to, to get him early. I think that could be at the detriment of the Golden State Warriors at times. When you have matchups that really are in favor of the Warriors, at times you'll see Wiggins has a favorable matchup. He yields and gives the ball up because they're looking for that extra pass for the extra shot to quote unquote the core guys. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think that that's at the detriment of the Golden State Warriors. If there's an opportunity, there should be a level of a great. It, it, it's so ironic. We sit here and we talk about this all the time with some of these teams. They'll get up in these interviews and they'll be like, yeah, man, you know. Uh, Steph and the guys, they told me, you know, they need me. They told me I needed to be aggressive. So that's what I was. And, you know, he winds up with 25 points and seven, you know, uh, rebounds and, you know, six assists. You really break those numbers down. He was mad aggressive in like the first quarter, right? Because he was the best matchup and nobody could stop him. And Steve Kerr actually had an epiphany and said, give him the damn basketball every damn time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But then when you see him the rest of the series, he's freaking obsolete. He's non-existent because the ball never got to him. The ball never landed in his hands at the times where he had that matchup. So that's what I'm saying. I think it is it is it is tantamount that the Warriors start revisiting this narrative about how they want to execute, how they want to start and finish games, who should wind up with the basketball. And I think if you really want Klay Thompson to be the best version of Klay Thompson, it shouldn't be at the expense of him doing what he's been doing at the two guard position. I really think that maybe sliding him to that three and maybe moving Wiggins to more of a two. And I know we talk about this as positionless basketball, but if we're talking about the splash brothers, we always talk about it in that narrative of Curry and Thompson as the one and two on a basketball team. And I think part of that is in the way that they prioritize Clay Thompson and his ability to get touches and get the opportunity to shoot the ball. Well, I don't think it's a matter of positions, and I think it's a matter of optionality on the on the offense. And you know, Clay is more of a pressure release as opposed to maybe somewhat of a focal point that you run your offense through. We had this even at the height of his powers, where we're like, all right, well, if you move them off the boards, could Clay Thompson go be your number one guy somewhere? Does he have enough um, versatility in his offensive game where he can just be that? Because he needs to be more or less set up. We know he can't really dribble and do much off the bounce, and but he's made a, a Hall of Fame career doing being just that on a team that was perfect for the way his, his style and play. So I think it's more about the options offensively as opposed to the actual position specifically. And there were times Wiggins took some shots. I was like, yo, that's, you know, that's Minnesota Wiggins there. You know, I felt like he was maybe trying to inject themselves, but you're right. That didn't last consistently. And that's what they probably need from him. Um, and not necessarily from the three point line, but just being, you know, as a guy who can get to the rim, he can boom on people all the time as well. He's got super great athleticism and some finishing capability, but then there's still the, 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 the conversation of Jordan Poole. And then obviously the other younger guys as well, too, that, you know, with let, me, let, me ask and you, Moody. let me ask this quick question, Shaw. Um, Cause I, I, I'm trying to pull this up real quick as we're having this conversation uh, and we're, we're talking about um, Wiggins and we're talking about clay, right? So, Clay averaged 21.1 and Wiggins averaged 17. Do you think Wiggins is a 20, 21 points, you know, score for this basketball team? Do you think that he's capable of being a 20, 21 point score? I think he, yeah, I think he can be that, you know, but I'll say this with this caveat. Part of the issues that we saw play throughout the course of the year <laughs> was Draymond's actual aversion to even looking at the basket. So I think if Dray if Draymond ultimately becomes and again, we're not talking about giving him 20 shots a game here. I, I think I just we want to be clear about that. But Draymond needs to be more aggressive and 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 taking some shots himself too. So I don't know if that allows Wiggins to continue to be a 20 point per game guy or if that comes from Clay, if Draymond stays and ultimately is like, all right, well let me try to give you 14, 15 a game instead of seven, eight or whatever it is that he's averaging. So, 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 like, there's nuances there. But to to your point, Wiggins is still younger, obviously more athletic and more, you know, just 
and 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 capable of scoring in different ways than Clay can. So sure, he can be a twenty point per game, but I think right at twenty, maybe not twenty two, twenty four, or anything like that. Interesting. All right, so what do we talk about with you know the the I don't use the word role players. Where where do we where do we put Jordan Poole now, Shaw? We have this conversation. Where does Jordan Poole fit in to this conversation? They've given him his bag, obviously, in this offseason, right? Um, and he I, – I, I'll just be honest with you. He hasn't impressed me at all of last two seasons in the playoffs. He's a dynamic scorer, no doubt. He has some magic plays. I think he's a quality player. I'm still struggling to figure out where the Warriors are going to – be able to like really utilize him that he is an, as, as, as big of an asset as what the money warrants, so to speak. Getting 20 points per game is great, but we're talking about the Warriors and we're talking about one of the most offensively effective, efficient basketball teams in the NBA. I almost feel like you could have gotten that from freaking, you know, Damian Lee last year. You could have gotten that from any a number of guys that were part of this last year's team that won this championship. So what are we talking about here with Jordan Poole? You bug it, man. <laughs> but, but I think he, he he's going to get a, what is it? A $24 million raise starting next year. Um, so he goes from 3.9 to 28, seven um, uh, next year alone. That's, that's, that, that's steep. And I think for a guy who was almost unplayable in the final stretches here of their season, you just kind of have to reevaluate. They'll give him every opportunity to, to recalibrate. Part of it is, yeah, does he feel some type of way? Did he feel some type of way all season long as a result of the Draymond incident? You know, he had flashes where he was he was more than fine. When when Curry was out, he and Clay were able to carry the team. And so I, I think it's just a matter of him regaining his confidence, you know, offensively. But he's not my personal appetite, you know, for 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 player. Like I'm not you know? oh, I'm not okay. really excited by his whatever he does out there. But I think they've kind of made their bed here now, and they've got to figure out a way to to make it happen. Um, because the draft, I mean, his capital right now is probably all not that great, and he's still young too. We were talking about RJ Barrett a little while ago, twenty two. Jordan Poole's only twenty three years old. But I think you can't move him now with this with this inflation in his salary after the playoffs he just had. Like I think that's going to be a very very difficult situation. So to me, Golden State is probably coming back almost in this exact same form. Assuming Bob Myers is like, all right, well, let's let's try it again. Um, and then they'll after next year, I think you'll really figure out the Warriors are done because again, Clay and Clay and Draymond Green they will technically will be off the books. Right. Okay. Well, I want to ask this question again differently than Shaw. What version of of Jordan Poole do you want to see for this Golden State Warriors team? Do you want to see him as a primary ball handler, nope. guy that handles the second unit, or do you want to see him as being a scorer? Meaning the ball should eventually wind up in his hands. He's going to get multiple opportunities to put the ball in the basket. The second one. <laughs> so, right. okay. um, and, because but I think that's hard because me that most of the time when you see him, he's pri acting as if, like he's a primary ball handler, which I don't think he's clearly as effective as someone who is being looked upon to go and well, score the basket. The Warriors are different though. So, I mean, Curry is not a traditional point guard. He can obviously dish it when he needs to and is getting double and triple team. We saw him, you know, drop, what, 14, 15 assists, you know, one of the games versus, versus the Lakers. But that's not Curry's preference, if you will. A lot of his assists come off comes off of the actual offense that the, that the, that the Warriors run. I think with Poole, he probably needs to be set up more as opposed to trying to take guys off the dribble. And then that's where maybe Draymond Green comes in as a, as a facilitator as well to try to help some of that going. Again, if some of these guys are not here – it changes the dynamic of what Poole can ultimately do offensively specifically. We know he's not going to do a whole lot defensively, but I think the best role for him is, hey, six man off the bench, be your best scorer off the bench, can be in some finishing and closing lineups here, probably always be a perennial six man of the year candidate as opposed to somebody who's a primary guy and definitely not a playmaker on your team. All right, Shaw. So in other words, we're saying that this Warriors team going to be all right next year. This is... I I think they can be if they didn't if they made no changes they could very much be back in the middle of the pack and scary against whoever they play in whatever round. Um, but if they if they themselves are saying as their current iteration is is not championship level, then I can't imagine that they bring it back because that's what they're that's what they're looking to do. So how they make changes, I have no idea. We talk about money a lot. Two eleven, that's what they owe next year. Two eleven. <laughs> 
And, <laughs> and I think it's like 400 and something when you count the luxury tax aspect that it as well too. So it's pretty astronomical and I don't know what changes they're going to make, but Bob Myers is at the head of that snake when it comes to being in the front office and we'll see if he can conjure some magic. Yeah, well, he's going to have to conjure some magic, whatever that magic is, it's got to be something a little bit better than the home cooking. You know what I'm saying? They got to have some, some of that on the road, you know what I'm saying? Flavor. You know, yeah. to, 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 to well, before we go, shouts to Iguodala. Heard he, he's he's finally hanging it up. Yeah. So you know, shouts to him. And Lord knows you know, that they wish they had him on that basketball court against the Lakers. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure LeBron. I'm sure LeBron was happy he didn't have to deal with that. <laughs> Relive those sweet memories. Yes, sir. You're tuned to the baseline. Cali Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA are covered at autopsy reports. Coming up, one last team to put on the slab. You know what that means? We gotta be talking them Philadelphia 76ers. Whew. And this might be a this might be post mortem. <laughs> this is uh more what, what what do you call them? More 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 Morbius? <laughs> Matrix? <laughs> Not Morpheus, Morbius, Morbius. <laughs> yeah, what's that? It's that that villain that uh, always battles oh, the against. vampire. Got it. Yeah, yeah, that dude. <laughs> Oh, obviously, he mustn't have been much of a damn villain. And if my man Shaw don't know who that is. The movie is terrible. <laughs> terrible movie. All right, man. We'll be talking sixes here on the baseline. We are back. Cali Warren Shaw, Baseline NBA Podcast. Last on the slab for our autopsy report, we'll be talking about the Philadelphia 76ers. Shaw, heartbreaking seven-game series. Um, you're getting ousted by the by the, by the the uh, Boston Celtics. I'm sure a lot of people are going to probably look at this game specifically and say to themselves, damn, you know, um, this. if we're going to continue to run this back, it probably won't be with Doc Rivers. He's obviously a black cat. <laughs> he's allergic to prosperity in the seven game series or allergic to a team's prosperity in a, in, in finals of some sort. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I, I've been saying this for the longest time that the, the roster there, there has to be another adjustment to this roster than, than what they currently have. Who knows? Maybe they may prove me wrong by what they accomplished this year, that if they decided to run it back where we could be good with it, I guess. But I, I'm still not completely sold that this is a good enough roster for us to be talking about winning an Eastern Conference Finals. At the same time, though, I have said that the only way that this team can get to the Eastern Conference Finals is because is by Joel Embiid being an MVP version of what he gave us up in the regular season, just wasn't able to do it in Game 7 against the Boston Celtics. But that just has to be him, period. And that is supposed to elevate the rest of the other guys on that basketball court. So I don't know it's, 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 it's kind of half and half when I look at both of it, because it was the perfect storm for us to question all of these things in the way that this team got knocked out in game seven against the Boston Celtics. Yeah. So cue all your memes, doc rivers, James Harden can't get it done in the playoffs again, doc rivers, six and 10 in, in seven game series and most, uh, most losses in, in, in game sevens, you know, in NBA history, et cetera, et cetera. James Harden always shrinking in the moment. You got Ben Simmons putting out memes, you know, about the Celtics. I mean, about the Sixers loss. Like, it's a very, very strange he's time. I think Phil I mean, he's yeah, just going he needs to chill all the way the hell out. Like, like, why are you inserting yourself into the chat as you alluded to? Right. Um, the theme, I think, though, for a lot of our autopsies, though, is like, especially with these elite level teams, you feel like, okay, well, is one more year the thing, or is the coaching move the potential thing? The thing here in Philadelphia is Harden. And not necessarily from his playoff failure aspects. Obviously, that's huge. But he has a player option. <laughs> and he's like, hey, I took less money to, to help form this roster that lost in the Game 7 in the semifinals. He has, for whatever reason, some taste and desire to return to Houston. Now that the, the, the temperature has changed there. I don't know if he's really a Yudoka guy. So I don't know if that, if that happens or if that would change, you know, maybe his decision making. but. The Sixers are going to go as James Harden does. And because of all the machinations that they've done with getting him and moving Simmons on or whatever the case would be, 
it's going to be hard for them, I think, and also to, if he decides to walk, to replace him. And that leaves a team good, bad, or indifferent, I think, in terms of like how you feel about Harden. It leaves a team forever change. And I don't know that they'd be able to make up for his loss if he were to walk away next year. That, to me, I think is the biggest question surrounding the Philadelphia 76ers. If Doc, they fire Doc, you know, we're scared to even record right now because we feel like that could potentially come down at any moment. You know, and you know, we both like Doc Rivers as an individual, and obviously he's had a lot of success in this league, but he's also had a lot of failures, and that's what he seems to be known for right now. To me, though, it's 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 it, it really kind of starts and ends with what James Harden does. And I, I'll say this one last thing. Now that Joel Embiid won the MVP, I I can't imagine that he plays anywhere close to 65 games again. He's going to load manage the shit out of the rest of his career just in hopes of trying to be healthy. And he continues to get hurt in the actual playoffs. But I think they're going to, he's going to take every precaution to try to like, hey, let me play 50, 55 games and try to save as much wear and tear on my legs so I can get in in the playoffs. And if the Lakers and Heat are any indication, like, hey, it may not really matter what seed you get in at. You can make a run if you have the requisite um, right roster. Well, I think that that'll, that, that'll kind of tell you what, you know, what the priority was then, if that's the case, right? Um, if suddenly now load management really becomes um, the focal point for Joel Embiid's. That's me saying it. You know, I understand that. But then what that also means is that it's putting the pressure on Daryl Morey now more than ever to make sure that he can construct a roster that can afford having Joel Embiid off the court. As can, I, can I interject really quickly? Yeah. And again, it will be really quick. Yeah. I think more Tyrese Maxey is, 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 is important. And I know it's a different dynamic and being a Maxey. Maxey's not an MVP type player. I get that. But I think Maxey can and should be doing more than he is. And I think he has the capability of doing that. Well, let's hope, so then let me ask you this question. Then. What's holding him back from doing that? Is that Doc Rivers? Is, is that the, 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 the way that the offense is, is, is constructed? Is that Joel Embiid? Is that James Harden? Like, what is holding him back from taking that "quote unquote" next step? It's 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 the fact that Harden is there and Harden plays the way that he plays. Harden is great. He's but he's ball dominant, and Maxi so he needs the ball in his hand. Maxi's not a spot up shooter at this stage of his career. Right. Okay. So, but let's let then. So then now we're really going to put Joel Embiid on the spot, right? Because what you're kind of saying, Shaw, is that. Those three can't coexist if you're talking about getting to that next level, eventually getting to an NBA finals, right? Like that's what that is going to come down to. Um, and money may dictate part of that, but I think style may dictate part of that. And I've seen where Joel Embiid has at times thrown um, Harden under the bus, justifiably so. I've also seen where Harden is thrown Embiid under the bus, right? And I've seen Maxi try to basically favor to both guys. So ultimately, what it comes down to me is, who does Joel Embiid ride or die with, right? The young upstart who's been trying to crack through and, and give people a reason for him to be injected as a key piece to this puzzle? Or do you ride with one of the more known, offensively gifted players of our generation who at times can be a liability defensively, but in most times doesn't seem to bring that tenacity of offense consistently in critical playoff series. Well, I, I it's hard to not go with the, 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 the surefire hall of famer, but again, the answer might be figured out for them. If James decide he ultimately wants to leave anyway, you know, I think more is going to do everything he possibly can to at least to try to give it one more year. And if they feel like doc is a problem, then they'll get rid of doc. Um, one way or another, it's if it's a matter of staggering the minutes um, and figuring out ways for Maxi then to you know become more offensive, do offensively dominant. Um, I think that's that's something that they need to to definitely look at ultimately because he seems like this guy with this budding potential to really help them. And now they're going to have to figure out a way to pay him as well too. His next year will be up for him, and they'll need to extend him as well um, because I think they know they're getting out of Tobias Harris now. Like he's not going to he's he's. He is who he is. That's just that's that's all I need to say about it. But there's not another level for Tobias Harris to contribute. I think at this stage, it's Maxi and Harden or kind of bust right now. At least when you're talking about the short term window for the Sixers. All right. So everything to your point, Shaw, is being dictated by what Harden's move, excuse me, move is going to be. 
Is there nothing on this roster that can be approved upon if if that wasn't to be the case? If 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 I, I'm not questioning that what you're saying doesn't make sense. I'm just saying where can there also be that opportunity, even if let's say Harden says, let's run it back? Because then it still means that you're gonna have to improve this roster because it is not good enough to get past the better teams. It just isn't. And if you're talking about potentially load managing, that means you're going to have to have a suitable backup center who is going to be able to relieve the stress of their ability to score the basketball when he is not on the court or to at least continue to maintain similar matchups that have allowed the the Sixers the opportunity to do the things that they do. Yeah, the the roster's weird. I'll give you that. You know, if Embiid is out, you know, Paul Reed, Again, he's you know, a rotation player at best. He's not somebody running. You almost, you almost struggled saying rotation. <laughs> I mean, he's fine, right? But it, it, it doesn't get too excited, you know. And they brought on Trez, and Trez didn't really, you know, he didn't fit the bill, and he's not really going to be long for this team. A roster moving forward as well, too. They brought Jalen McDaniels in. He's his contract is up. I thought that was a shrewd move, but then he didn't seem to really be able to crack the rotation within the, within the playoff, but he's a guy who I thought had a lot of upside, but again, he's more of a four, you know, three, four, then more he is maybe even a small ball five. Um, I don't know what the names are out there in free agency that allows them to, to, to make a move. If Harden declines his option, it, de- it significantly decreases their salary cap. So then there's options there that could potentially become available to them. Um, but Again, it, it, that's why I keep coming back to that. It kind of depends what what he does to, for them to be able to figure out what their next move is. But you're saying if he comes back, then they're, they're more cap strapped in a sense of being able to try to bring in guys. And and nobody wants, I shouldn't say nobody wants, but PJ Tucker and and, and Daniel House and, and Cork Maz and Yang and guys like that are not tradable assets. Like they're, they're players that are fill in, you know, for the bigger, for, for the bigger deal. And so that's why I'm saying they don't have a lot of moves that they can make if Harden does decide to opt in to balance out the rest of the roster and give Embiid probably the help he needs at that five position as a backup. All right. So what's our outlook with the with the Philadelphia 76ers? I mean, a lot of it is going to be dictated by, you know, the headlines and, and what potential moves are, 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 are going to be made. And I'll even say this. A lot of that, it could be more on the focus of what Daryl Morey says or doesn't say about what needs to happen for this roster, right? Um, b- because he's also been known to be somewhat of a controversial person, likes to inject himself, you know what I'm saying? Likes to, likes to kind of, quote unquote, take on the smoke. You know what I mean? So what what are we saying here with this Sixers team? How controversial can it be for their offseason? Uh, <laughs> it could be as quiet as still as a river creek or as volatile as a hurricane and tornado. It really does. Like I said, depending on what Harden does and depending on what Doc, what they decide to do with Doc Rivers, um, I don't think they obviously don't want to just run it completely back. But even Paul Reed, as we're talking about him, he's a free agent. So <laughs> they got to figure that out. Shake Milton's a free agent. So do you just pay those guys or do you look for new parts that make sense to complement? And I think that's what they'll ultimately try to do. But I just don't have a good sense of what that is right now. Um, so, you know, again, they have some things that they need to figure out ultimately, um, with those two main pieces and two moving parts. I just don't know at this stage, a a lot of people love the idea of PJ Tucker and Jay Crowder. I just don't know how impactful those types of guys are right now. You know, I just, I just, I just don't know, but, but Tucker is Harden's, is Harden's friend. (laughs) So, you know, but if Harden decides to go then maybe you can send Tucker along with them. You know, I, I don't know. I think I think the Sixers BJ e. Tucker in the beard. <laughs> I think the Sixers are in are in a are in a very, very interesting position that is not as clear as I think it is for some of the teams that we autopsy on this specific show. Well said, brother. Well said. My God, how do we get through bodying up four teams, Shaw? Very quickly. I'll tell you, boy. Yeah, you are nip and tuck. Well, man, we, we had to skate. I, I'm, I'm, I was more Dexter, but you were nip and tuck. Yeah, that well, was a good show back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> we want to hear from you guys, man. Obviously, a lot of these teams, man, have got a lot of question marks and some interesting off seasons ahead of them. And we're only going to be able to watch and see, uh, probably get our popcorn ready on what may take place uh, for the long off season ahead. As always, man, Shaw, it's been great doing this with you. And um, 
Hopefully we will not be, you know, cast with the task at hand again to do four teams in one episode. Well, there's only four teams left, so they can't all be gone at the same time. So I don't think we'll have that. So although, although we'll right. like you said, it's going to be a war. It will be a war. So who knows? That would be something. For the baseline, Cali Warren Show. We appreciate you guys. Thanks for hopping on board with us this week. We'll catch up with you next time.